Hello and welcome to Credit Matters TV, a show highlighting Standard & Poor's analysis and global perspective on the latest credit market developments. I'm Jeff Sexton for Standard & Poor's Financial Institutions Ratings. Today I'm joined by Eric Hedman, Managing Director, and Gary Marcucci, Director in Standard & Poor's Insurance Ratings, for a conversation on the insurance industry and the market for cat bonds and the trends impacting both as we've entered the 2011 hurricane season. Eric and Gary, welcome and thank you both for joining us. Thanks. Gentlemen, the focus of today's discussion was the subject of a panel at our recent 2011 insurance conference. Among one of the things that the panel noticed was that there's been a resurgence in the cap on market since the financial crisis started. Gary, can you talk to us a little bit about what we're seeing in terms of the new structures that have been put in place as well as overall issuance? Uh, since the, uh, the financial crisis of 2008, the cap on market back then seized up like pretty much everything else did. But it's come back to the uh, the issuance has come back to the pre-crisis levels, which is around four to five billion dollars. However, this year we've actually seen a bit of a slowdown in total issuance uh, rated by S and P. Last year at this time we rated about two billion dollars with the natural peril cap bonds, and right now we're about one point four billion. And we don't expect much coming on right now since hurricane season is starting, and that is the predominant risk. Uh, we think that is a function of the RMS model changes, which has been discussed by a lot of people, including those on our panel, plus also the uh, events that have happened earlier in the year, the uh, Tohoku earthquake, the Christchurch uh, earthquake. Uh, that's caused a lot of disconnect in the market as it relates to pricing. People are trying to figure out where their losses are. So currently um, the market's kind of just on, on a bit of a hiatus. As to the changes in the structures post-crisis, what we saw was a movement away from credit risk. Uh, Viewed as a diversifying peril, cap bonds did take on credit risk, uh, and it was borne out by four bonds defaulting linked to Lehman Brothers. To solve that issue, investors uh, requested, or then the issuers came out with structures where the, mon the proceeds from the sale of the notes was invested in money market funds, which elim eliminate most credit market risk. Um, but however, we're seeing a movement towards tri-party repo agreements where you are, ta you are taking a little bit of credit exposure. Granted, there are daily over-collateralization targets that have to be met based on mark-to-market -market pricing, so it's, it's much more secure than the old total return swaps, which were uh, did present a bit of a problem you know, back in 2008. Building on that, it's been an eventful year so far with regards to natural catastrophes, and as I mentioned in the introduction, uh, we just entered hurricane season. Eric, can you give us a sense of our panel's overall view and perspective on cap bonds and reinsurance with regards to capacity? and the role each will play in providing coverage. And can you give us our perspective as well? Sure, thanks, Jeff. Um, let's begin with a, with a quick explanation of cap bonds. Cap bonds are risk-linked securities that cover a range of naturally occurring catastrophes like hurricanes, earthquakes, severe thunderstorms, windstorms, typhoons, and wildfire, wildfires. Investors buy the bonds and are taking on the risks of these events occurring at certain thresholds, whereby if an event happens, or multiple events, the bondholders may not get paid debt service. If the events do not happen or a trigger does not happen, they receive their debt service on their bonds as expected. Our panelists took the position or viewpoint that cap bonds and traditional reinsurance are complementary to each other for insurers. Both cap bonds and reinsurance serve as a means for insurers to cover the risk of catastrophic losses related to certain blocks of business. Insurers use cap bonds by issuing securities to mitigate some portion of the cap risk in their portfolios by shifting a portion of it to the capital markets. Panelists thought that they should, they should go together hand in hand, whereby traditional reinsurance is a one-year renewable product and cap bonds could help cover the risk of a market seize up when the reinsurance policy is up for renewal. Alternatively, traditional reinsurance benefits were, were identified by the panel, most notably that traditional reinsurance is much faster to put in place and can sometimes be much more flexible. The question of capacity for the cap bond market uh, also came up, and we think that that will certainly become clearer later this year, but the panelists overall thought there was still significant investor demand in the cap bond sector. Overall, the trading of cap bonds after the Japanese earthquake and tsunami led to broad spread widening, which has come back in to some degree since mid-March. Panelists believe that investors continue to view cap bonds as an attractive diversif diversification play that is part of their overall asset allocations in their portfolios. Gary, the Japan earthquake highlighted the need to model for new and emerging perils. 
from what our panel said and our experience, what is the prevailing trend within the industry for reinsurance and cap bonds with regards to taking into consideration these new and emerging perils? Uh, finding diversifying perils is kind of like the holy grail, I guess you could say. Uh, because U.S. wind is the predominant risk, other perils which are viewed as diversifying by cap bond investors are viewed similarly by the companies that write this risk. So what makes the cap bond worthwhile, you can supply this three years of collateralized reinsurance, the pricing on these diversifying perils tends to be relatively cheap or relatively inexpensive, if you will. So uh, it's harder to justify bringing a cap bond to market because the expenses involved in bringing the bond to market are such that it's just easier for the companies to, uh, to write the, the risk in the traditional reinsurance market. However, that said, um, there were substantial losses taken from both the uh, Christchurch earthquake and the Tohoku earthquake, and also if you go back last year, the Chile earthquake and to a lesser extent the Haiti earthquake, at least as far as insured values are concerned. Uh, I think it's going to focus the risk, that, uh, focus this risk on investors and on companies that write this. That yes, these risks do really exist out there. So even though they might be relatively inexpensive, you know, there's something you might want to get reinsurance for. So I think that uh, this could, like I guess, put additional focus on these perils, and that the capital markets could provide a solution there because again, it'll be there for the three years, and it'll help mitigate losses for the companies that did experience losses. Uh, on the risks they wrote for, for those perils. One of the most notable events that's currently impacting the reinsurance industry and the market for cat bonds has been the release of RMS Risk Inc. 11.0. Eric, can you give us an idea of what our panel's view of that was? And then, Gary, if you could actually provide the S&P perspective from a credit ratings perspective on that, that would be great as well. Eric, I'll start with you. Sure, Jeff. The RMS version 11 was discussed not only on our panel, but in a number of other panels at S&P's insurance conference. RMS is a property and casualty modeling firm that provides insurers and others with estimated exposures to various perils. The resulting output is utilized by insurers to evaluate their exposures, risks, and pricing. The reason that the RMS model update is getting significant attention in the market is that the results are suggesting the insurer's exposures are higher than other modeling firms would indicate. The industry is continuing to work through the results as many insurers at our conference indicated that they were reviewing the version 11 results. One speaker on a different panel mentioned he thought it would take months to digest and understand the changes. My panel did spend a good deal of time on the issue of RMS version 11. Overall, the panelists thought that changes in some certain components of the model were welcome, whereas other components or assumptions in the model made sense. This is, as you can probably imagine, an ongoing debate in the market and will be for the next few months, in our opinion. And Gary, can you give us S&P's perspective on what the release of RMS Risk Link 11.0 may mean for ratings? Uh, to be clear, this is not the first time a company's ever updated the model. Every couple of years, one or two functions of the modeling do get updated. Either the whole hurricane model could be updated, the earthquake model, whatever. But We've seen these before in the past. What differs here is just the magnitude of the change where we've been told that the probability of attachment, which is the first dollar loss and to what we rate to, um, could be potentially 100% or more greater than what we had rated to only a year or so ago. Uh, this has forced us to put 15 bonds on credit watch negative, meaning there could be downgrades of pr approximately one to three notches going forward. Rather than just take the model results, so we are currently engaging in discussions with RMS, the seedants of the bonds that are affected by, these, by this change, as well as with other industry participants to get their view and their perspectives on these, on these changes because, again, they are so significant versus what we've seen in the past. We'd rather ver be very as comfortable as we can be regarding these changes to see if maybe uh, certain modules in the, in the model might be potentially overstating the risk. So again, just like it's taking the industry months to digest this, we are taking our time too because we'd rather get as much information as possible before we go and uh, make the ratings changes. So with that, we may want to hope that hurricane season is a benign one and that we don't go through and reach Hurricane Nikita this year. Uh, on that note, I'd like to thank uh, Gary Martucci and Eric Hedman for joining me for this discussion of the trends and issues impacting the reinsurance industry and the market for cat bonds. And for those of you who are interested in this topic, as well as all the topics discussed at this year's Standard & Poor's Insurance Conference, log on to 
www.events.standardandpours.com forward slash insurance. On behalf of all of us here at Standard & Pours, thank you and take care.